Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Keith Hanlon, and I would love to thank St. Francis University, Dr. Daniel Atwood, and the Center for the Fine Arts for inviting me to make this video for you guys. Um, they asked me to do a little bit of a flute master class for you, and I, I thought uh, a little bit about it and figured I'd give it a go. So a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Um, I did my doctorate at West Virginia University, my master's degree Virginia Commonwealth University, and my undergraduate was at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, I served as a military bandsman. I played flute and piccolo in the United States Army for almost eight years, and uh, I've recorded with the Keystone Wind Ensemble and been an orchestral player and a college professor. So uh, hopefully I can bring something to the, the video uh, that you'll be able to use. <clears throat> Uh, I thought maybe we could start with some basic concepts. Uh, first of all, air is very important. Uh, without air, the flute doesn't even make a sound. So uh, when you think about the air, um, my approach is to make it very vocal. Uh, I treat playing the flute a lot like I would singing. Uh, the air support is coming from down below around the belt line. Um, and, and it's all about speed and volume and direction and how you're using your air. Um, faster air, slower air that changes the pitch, the volume of air, how much air you use, how little air you use can change the volume of sound. Um, so you want to think very much about that. And then the direction. You want to make sure that the air is hitting the blow edge, this very, very sharp opposite side. Nice clear sound. Now if I speed the air up, the pitch will go. If I slow it down, the pitch goes flat. Um, so as you're tuning and thinking about tuning, think about speeding up the air to raise the pitch and slowing the air down to lower the pitch. Uh, also, whether you're aiming down into the flute versus aiming beyond the flute. You can get a very different color, a very different sound, and just by adjusting the angle of the air and how it's going into the flute, your tone can clear up so quickly. It's one of the quickest things that I'm able to fix with my students when I'm working with them. Just changing the angle of the air. Don't be afraid to experiment. Make something sound worse in order to make it sound better. Um, and that's, that's part of the process of discovering what works for you. <clears throat> um, posture is also something that's very important. Um, if you are used to practicing sitting on your bed without using a music stand, you're going to hunch over, you're going to collapse in on the airstream, and you're not going to be able to support that sound. I recommend, uh, and, and I've talked to people about this too, posture should be tall, but not rigid. Everything should be very, very comfortable. Um, think relaxed, but tall. Nice, like there's a thread coming out of the top of your head that just pulls you up. Um, and if you have questions and you know anybody who sings in choir, talk to them because they're, they're usually focused on posture most of the time in order to produce uh, better air support when they're singing. So if you think about posture, I would be doing nothing but aiming the air into the ground. The sound can be very collapsed, can very, be very closed off. Think about aiming the air out over your audience. Think about aiming the sound out over your audience, keeping your chin up, shoulders relaxed. And as far as the angle of the flute goes, it can vary slightly. It doesn't and shouldn't be perfectly parallel to the ground. A little bit of an angle or dip allows the shoulders to relax. It allows the, the, the posture to be relaxed. Um, 10 to 15 degrees is, a, is about what is considered acceptable. If you look at back at some of the, the great players like Ron Paul, he did play on a, a very sharp angle, um, but that isn't something that's recommended or really good for anybody, but it worked for him and that's how he played. Um, so keep that in mind that when you're watching other people play, everybody's a little bit different. You've got to find what's comfortable for you and you've got to find what works for you. So again, I recommend Lifting from the sternum, like you've got a thread pulling right out of the top of your head. Stay nice and tall. Flute, about 10 to 15 degree angle. Not rigid. I spent years in the military, and we did stand 
at attention, very tall and rigid. That's not a, a, a great playing position, but that in the military is more for the, the showmanship of it. So again, keeping everything really relaxed. If you ever feel tightness in your neck and in your shoulders, roll your shoulders, roll your neck, relax, stretch, and, and that'll help to keep everything uh, open and relaxed. Um, now let's talk a little bit about practice. <clears throat> uh, you probably have heard this from people you've worked with. Slow and steady wins the race. Um, when you're practicing things, you should take your time. Uh, they're, they're, unless you're on a time crunch to get something done for a performance that, that's imminent, take it slow. It's better to focus on getting a good sound, moving the fingers in a relaxed and comfortable way, rather than trying to rush and learn it quickly. The other problem is that when you rush to learn something quickly, you often learn a mistake and don't even realize you're doing it. And then you have to unlearn that mistake. So when I say slow and steady, relax and enjoy it. When you're playing your scale, think about how your fingers move. Focus on what your jaw, what your air, what your mouth, what your embouchure, what your fingers are doing, how it feels to play that scale. Keep it nice and slow and just listen to it. It's, it's a little bit like, I call it flute yoga for my students. Just playing a repetitive pattern, playing something that, that you can listen to the variations on. If you're playing it nice and slow and you're feeling the fingers move, you're going to notice whether you have a little bit of that slop in between the notes, that extra little blip that you want to try to get rid of. Playing it faster is not going to fix that. You just won't hear it as quickly. Um, so take your time, play things slow, play them relaxed. If you practice in a relaxed, comfortable manner, you'll perform in a, in a relaxed, comfortable manner. Really, you're learning it slow, and then later on you just play it fast. So slow and steady does win the race. Don't just practice the fun parts. We all have those things that we like to practice, the things that we naturally play very well. Those are great. Make sure you're practicing them with a metronome to keep yourself honest. But practice the stuff that you don't like to practice because that's the stuff that needs the work. Um, especially even the easy parts. You know, I'll be the first one to admit <clears throat> the one time I skip over practicing something that seems reasonably easy, I get into a rehearsal or performance and find out, wow, I really should have spent a little more time on that. So just trust me, that slow stuff, the whole notes, the half notes, practice that stuff too because it does matter. Um, think of things in smaller chunks. Don't try to learn a whole page of music all at one time. Take four measures, take eight measures. Practice them, practice them slow, piece them together. Think of the whole page of music like a jigsaw puzzle. Work on one section at a time. You can even jump around and work on things piecemeal just to practice those little sections and then start putting them together when they start to make more sense. There's no rush to actually get it all the way from start to begin, beginning to the end. So small pieces, jump around. It's actually been <clears throat> shown, and, and I'm not a psychologist, but I've read some, some articles that working on chunks, jumping around, and doing about a five minute bit and jumping to another section helps the brain to process and remember things better um, rather than just playing the same 16 measures for 20 minutes straight. So do five minutes here, five minutes here, five minutes here. If you need to, move to a separate piece of music play the same kind of stuff there too, then come back to that first piece of music. I've used this in my own practice and I find that it, it really works well for me. But again, everybody's very different. We all have different learning styles. So do what works for you. <clears throat> and in the end of it all, if it's not fun, you're not going to do it anyway. So make it a game. Give yourself a reward if you're able to do something three times in a row without any mistakes. But also make sure you set yourself up so that you're successful. Play something three times in a row without any mistakes at a tempo that's reasonable. And you don't want to just keep clicking that metronome up faster and faster. Take your time. Pace yourself. If you think about having a concert in a month and you need to have something at 130 clicks and you only have it at 100 clicks today 
the concert's 30 days away, all you have to do is successfully go up one click faster every single day. And when you look at it math-wise, it makes a lot of sense that it shouldn't be that crazy to try to increase that tempo to 30, 130 or 30 clicks more. Um, so a couple of things that I would like to, to demonstrate. Um, find some favorites, some old favorites. This is one of my favorite books. I like this because it's got repetitive patterns. I use it regularly as my flute yoga book. The, the very first exercise, I make most of my students, well, all of my students memorize it because, well, because it's easy to memorize once you understand it. Um, most of the students have a little freak out session when I ask them to memorize it, but once they realize the pattern that's in involved, they usually can come back a week or two after they've started it and play it from memory mostly. This, it's just a simple pattern, and I like to play it nice and slow. Simple. You can hear everything. I had a couple little blips in there, too. It's been a very long day. Um, but I can hear that, and I can work with it. I can repeat that pattern. I don't actually have to follow the exercise itself. I can stick with that pattern if it's a particularly tricky, tricky pattern for me. Take it slow. Take it steady. Have your favorites that you go back to when you have a bad day. There's no reason that you need to push forward on something new. You can afford to take a day and work on something you've played before just to, to help you get out of a rut. So this is one of my favorite books. The exercises in here I use with all of my students, um, and that is the Toffanel and Gobert uh, 17 studies. So um, I, I highly recommend it. And don't be afraid to go back and revisit etudes you've worked on or exercises you've worked on before. We all have our favorites. We all have the ones that we've enjoyed learning. So take time, revisit. You might be surprised that something that was very difficult for you in the past might be a lot easier now. In this section of the video, I thought it would be kind of fun to demonstrate some extended techniques. Um, extended techniques are anything that makes the flute uh, sound different than it was initially intended. Uh, the beautiful flute sound that we, we all know and love. Anything that's different than that uh, and uses the flute in a new or different way could be considered extended technique. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of them talk about a little bit about how they work and uh, how how to do them. Um, and there are plenty more out there that you can read about and, and look online. Um, the first one, which is an extended technique, but it isn't really seen as an extended technique anymore because it's so prevalent in a lot of our repertoire, is the flutter tongue. Um, if you've ever uh, rolled your tongue in a foreign language or even jokingly said, ruffles have ridges, Fluttering the tongue. Fluttering while you play. Is what creates that, that flutter tongue sound. Um, some people have a hard time fluttering the front of the tongue, so they do what's called a glottal flutter. The little dangly thing in the back of your throat. Uh, and some other foreign languages use the, the, the glottal sounds. Doesn't sound as pretty, but it is effective. Uh, it's a little harder to control because you don't have the, the, as much control over the back of the throat as you do the tip of the tongue. But for some people who have uh, difficulties in fluttering or rolling those, those R's, that's how they would actually make that work. Um, <clears throat> another effect uh, would be multiphonics. Uh, that's playing any more, uh, more than one note at a time. Um, and there are different ways that this can be done um, through the use of fingerings. Uh, there are pretty multiphonics. It's kind of cute. You can hear that I'm playing two notes at one time. Then there are some that just make an effect. Isn't pretty, but it does have a purpose. Um, so a lot of composers 
<clears throat> performers have uh, explored ways to make these different sounds to basically treat as a different color or uh, on the palette um, or a different brush shape as they're creating their, their, their work because they want just a different effect. Um, there are also pitch bends. Uh, there are a couple ways to do this. Uh, open hold by sliding the fingers. You can also do it by dropping the head down or raising the head up while rolling the flute. Um, shouldn't be used for tuning, but it is a great effect, and uh, there are some pieces I've played that require a nice long drop in the pitch. It's a really cool thing to do, really, really uh, can help paint a better picture in a piece if it's being used. Um, <clears throat> singing and playing. This is one of my favorites because I actually use this as a tone exercise. Um, because the flute is such a vocal instrument, uh, unlike a trumpet or a clarinet with a reed or a mouthpiece, <clears throat> the flute doesn't have what we call back pressure. It's very limited in how much pushback from the instrument we get. Um, so we have to create our own just like a vocalist. And what that means is that allows us to su sustain the, the sound and, and uh, carry a phrase over one full breath. We have to create some kind of uh, resistance that isn't there. And so singing and playing forces you to actually hold that breath and, and, and uh, contain it so that it's not going to just blow through the flute. <sighs> um, and when we sing and play, um, that's one of those things that uh, it does take practice. Don't get frustrated with it. Um, so when you sing and play, the way I like to present it first is start by humming. Hmm. And after you hum, push the air out as in a who. Who. And then we push it into the flute until the sound uh, starts to speak. So we keep humming, push the air into the flute, and then keep humming while the flute speaks. Again, it's a hum. And you gradually release the air into the flute. Now this singing and playing can be done a number of different ways for different effects. Um, one I, I love to demonstrate is, is singing, two different singing and playing two different lines. And I also like to demonstrate the neat effect that it has when it is uh, varied widely. Um, that effect itself is uh, used in a few pieces of music and uh, that is just a lot of fun. So Another effect is something called the jet whistle. Um, this involves closing all of the keys on the flute and altering the angle, actually blowing directly into the flute, and it creates a whistle effect. It's quite loud. It's something to be careful about because it is a little loud, and the pressure that you're blowing through the flute um, could potentially blow a pad out. So just, I would read up on that and uh, just save it for when you're working with a teacher. But it is a neat effect. One more time. Um, there's a tongue ram, also closing all of the, the keys on the flute, and this sounds kind of like a, a cork or a pop gun. Um, what's done is you actually put the embouchure hole over the opening of your mouth completely, and as you blow through the flute, you push the tongue into the embouchure hole, and it stops the air immediately. Um, and then there's the fun stuff that I like to teach when I go out and do my workshops as a Trevor James artist, um, and that's uh, beatboxing. It's become very, very popular. Uh, you guys can go and, and look on YouTube and see a number of people doing it these days. Uh, Greg Patillo is one of my favorites. He, he beatboxes and has a lot of fun. Um, so 
please go watch watch him. Uh, he's he's a lot of uh, really enjoyable to watch. So the basics of beatboxing, <clears throat> the whole idea of vocal percussion or beatboxing. If you've seen Pitch Perfect, everybody has heard beatboxing. The fundamental idea is that you're creating a percussive sound with your voice. Um, and how that's been applied to the flute is we were playing tunes and creating the percussion with the flute as an amplification device. The, the basic concepts are three main instruments, uh, bass drum, snare drum, and cymbal. With those and variations and changing syllables, you can get a lot of different sounds and how percussionists put those together, create different styles or different rhythms. Um, so starting first, demonstrating the, the quickest way or the, the phrase that most or best represents those three instruments is the phrase boots and cats. Um, boots and cats, we have the bass drum, the b from boots, the k from cats is the snare, and that is the, the uh, symbol. So the easiest thing to start with is the snare drum, using a k or a hard c sound, k, k, k. And if you notice when I do that, there's no flute embouchure. My mouth is open and the air is coming right out, nice and loud. Um, you can't be, be shy when you're beatboxing. It's going to be loud. There's going to be a little bit of spit. So a hard uh, a K or C sound. We take that and apply it to the flute. And the next thing you know, we have a nice snare drum type of sound. How you change the shape of the mouth and the vowels can vary how that sound uh, resonates. The second sound that's really easy to do is the cymbal sound, the TS. The tongue is on the roof of the mouth, right behind the front teeth. And you do that into the flute as well. Again, notice that there's no flute embouchure. We've worked so many years to get that beautiful flute sound, and now I'm asking you to not use a flute, flute embouchure. Um, and then the hardest one, I think, is the bass drum. And if you think about the bass drum as a... a what it is, a large membrane that's vibrating when it's hit, it's got to have a percussive, percussive pop to it, but it also has to have some depth. So the, the jaw is nice and open, and that popping sound is really important. You can't just say and get a bass drum sound, and it's got to be pushed from down here. We add that to the flute, we start adding that together, quietly saying the syllables, We start adding more air, and then we put it into the flute. And that's the fundamental of beatboxing. And when I go out and do my clinics, I like to show students that, you know, this can be a fun way to practice a lot of things. I like to multitask when I practice. So uh, using, uh, working on my breathing while also working on tone production, practicing a new technique. Um, I incorporate multiple things because I don't have a ton of time anymore. I'm, I'm a busy guy. And uh, so when I do practice, I try to make sure it's very focused practice with the most efficient use of my time. And so one of the best things about beatboxing is that you're practicing your breathing and at the same time, you're, you're learning a little bit more about your embouchure and how to control it. And you can add a third level to that by simply practicing a scale. Most people find that a lot of fun and they can't believe, wow, I can do that. Um, it, it makes practicing scales a little bit more fun. Uh, it makes learning to beatbox a little less less challenging because everything is very is kept very simple. So have fun, experiment, and see what you can come up with. And watch my friend Greg on YouTube. You may have noticed in the background here, when I'm not in the way, I have a few other flutes here, um, and I wanted to demonstrate a few of those for you. Um, these are flutes that I own and that I play fairly regularly uh, in either orchestral or flute ensemble or quintet. Uh, it just depends on what, what the ensemble requires. Um, many of you have seen a piccolo. Um, piccolo is one octave higher than the concert flute. Uh, it doesn't have the extra notes at the bottom that the concert flute has. The first note on the piccolo or the lowest note on the piccolo is a D. The highest note will say high C, but 
C sharp is possible. Um, so the piccolo being one octave higher, the embouchure, everything, the air is moving faster through a smaller hole. It takes a lot more control. It Just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's necessarily easier to play. It actually is the opposite of that. It's a little more challenging. Um, the piccolo is meant to be heard. It usually soars above above the orchestra and, and in the band. Many of you know Stars and Stripes, um, and uh, it's a very well-known march uh, that features the piccolo. Uh, but the piccolo, the lowest note, and then the highest note, high C. Um, again, high C sharp is doable. I don't know why you would want to play it. But uh, the piccolo has uh, varying registers. The low register sounds very childlike. And up high, um, which I will uh, save you from this time around, uh, is used a lot in uh, orchestral works to represent storms and thunder and lightning because of the, the harsh and, and more shrieking quality. Um, but, the, but the piccolo is very flexible. And uh, lately, uh, the last... 40, 50 years, people have started to write a lot more solo literature for the piccolo, and it's become a, a more soloistic instrument. Uh, I personally, the piccolo is one of my favorite instruments, and I, I love to play it every chance I get. The next instrument I want to demonstrate is the alto flute. Well, the alto flute does look a lot like a concert flute in size. Uh, that'll work a little bit better. The concert flute and the alto flute are different in size. The alto flute is a little bit bigger. It's uh, pitched in the key of G and sounds a perfect fourth lower. Um, this, the range of the alto flute is the same as the concert flute. Uh, the low note on the alto flute goes down to a low C. The fingerings on all of these instruments are the same. Uh, just in case any of you have an opportunity to try, you don't have to learn new fingerings to play any of these instruments. Um, but the lowest note on the alto flute is the low C, um, and I can play a high C on it as well. Uh, you will notice, and I demonstrate it here in a minute, um, that the alto flute does sound different than the concert flute. It's got a, a lower, warmer, more haunting quality to it. Um, the upper register tends to be a little more harmonically rich uh, and doesn't sound as clear, but it, it's part of the, the nuance of the alto flute. Um, Alto flute, many of you, if you've ever heard California Dreamin', there's a very uh, well-known alto flute solo in, the, in pop music in that song. Um, but the alto flute... ...has a nice warm sound. I also love to play the alto flute when I get a chance. Uh, it, it, has very different, uh, very different voice, and it's it's a lot of fun to work with. And last but not least, the bass flute. A uh, couple things. This is one octave lower than the concert flute. Uh, for the most part, they ha it has the same range, uh, down to low C, up to high C. Uh, you'll notice that the head joint is curved around because the flute is so long. Even with my long arms, there's no way I would be able to play this if the flute was straight. So the head joint is curved around so that we can actually reach this uh, and play it more comfortably. The alto flute does have a curved head joint as well. For some people, they find it more comfortable, but generally all bass flutes uh, have a curved head joint. Um, there are a couple companies that do make variations on different shapes of bass flutes, but generally this is the one that, this is the style that you're going to see. Um, the low C on the bass flute, one octave below the low C on the concert flute. Um, and the high C... When I play the bass flute, my job is very different than it is in t when I'm playing the concert flute. Um, in flute choirs, this is one of the lower voices. It plays the, the, the bass line uh, in, in most flute choirs. Um, some of you may have seen much larger instruments. I would demonstrate them if I if I had them, but I, I, I highly recommend going out to Google and uh, Googling contrabass and subcontrabass flutes because they're they're quite interesting to see. But the bass flute is fairly uh, recognizable. Some of you may have seen them before. Most colleges have these. 
Uh, there are lots of people in the community now that have these because flute choirs have become very, very popular. Uh, so bass flutes, uh, you may have a chance to play one sometime. Uh, fingerings are all exactly the same, uh, but it just they're more spread out and, and the embouchure and the air are a little different. Um, one of the other cool things about the bass flute is because it's so large that if I start doing some beatboxing on it, it really tends to resonate. Um, which is also a lot of fun to do. So I hope that you've enjoyed um, my video. Uh, it's one of the first times I've made a video for, uh, for anybody, so I, I hope that you get something out of it. Uh, you are welcome to reach out to me personally at my email. Uh, it, and I'll put it on the bottom of the screen here shortly. And uh, if you have any questions, um, looking for some online lessons, uh, or just, just want to talk about the flute in general, you're welcome to email me. Um, again, thank you to St. Francis University, um, the Center for Arts, and Dr. Daniel Atwood, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, for asking me to do this. I hope you guys have a good night. Bye.